In the continuous domain, we always think of time, we, we think of all of the signals existing at every single point um, in time. And it's, it's this idea that allows us to calculate a derivative where we have an infinitesimally small amount of time, right? And so even if I zoom in, it doesn't matter how far I zoom in there, I'll always have a continuous change. As soon as I introduce samplers, as soon as I have some of these things, um, I actually end up with something that is perhaps more easily represented in a table. And I have something like a time, and I have something like a u, if that is the sample value of u, and I have at time zero, I have zero, at time one, I have one, and so on. And this is a very uh, deep conceptual difference. It's the difference between having a signal which exists at every moment in time and a signal that only exists at the sampling points. When I say these things only exist at these times, I'm being quite literal because most of the time when we are working with sampled signals, we are using uh, digital computers. And digital computers um, have a clock. And that clock effectively makes, ex uh, makes instructions execute at a particular moment in time. And then the computer does literally nothing in the in-between moments of time. And so in, in kind of every way that really makes sense, and even if you were doing this uh, calculation by hand, if you were filling in some relationship between you and let's say you try to calculate y <coughs> at corresponding moments in time, you would literally not calculate intervening values. You would be doing some calculation for time zero, some other calculation for time one, and so on, and you could refer to previous times, but there would be no way for you to refer to intermediate times. And this idea um, requires some additional tooling, some analysis tooling that we need uh, to figure out how to handle that. And now this is the, so all of that you've heard before, that's the same spiel that I have uh, in CPN, but um, the new part is I think I'm trying to get to what the difference looks like um, when we actually do a calculation using uh, correct analytical treatment of discrete systems and approximations, which is what up to now we have been using. And I think the easiest way to understand this that I've come up with is to imagine that I'm trying uh, initially, let me move that out of the way, let's initially just say what does it look like when I have our good old friend, the first order process. If I subject such a process to a step response, right? Everybody by now will know, or to a step input, if, if it's a gain one process like this, um, I'm going to draw, draw zero so that it's visible here. So we, we've got our input uh, going like this. And then obviously, hopefully by now, everybody will kind of know that there's this kind of a step response that we have, and it eventually goes. So there's... And that's what it looks like. And now I want you to focus on the idea that it's curved, right? So this continuous process um, is changing in a non, well, it is not moving in a straight line. It is moving along this exponential curve. And I want you to remind yourself that if we were doing something like Euler integration, for instance, to obtain that curve, our approach would be fundamentally to subdivide that curve into straight line pieces, right? So we would choose some kind of uh, change in time, and we would calculate the slope, the derivative at that initial moment in time as soon as the step has changed. Is that clear enough for everybody? Can everybody see on the screen there? Uh, as soon as that, that uh, step changes,
uh, and then we jump immediately to the next position. Now, zoomed in like this, or with a large step like this, it's obvious that we will not obtain the exact analytical result of the system responding to a step like that, right? And at its heart, this is the problem that we set out to solve using uh, analytical treatment of uh, discrete systems and including the Z-transform. It's this idea that if I were simply to take this uh, analog process, this continuous process, and subject it to this kind of step signal, and I want you to understand that the, the stepped signal is the kind of signal that comes out of a hold element, right? So if, if that were the system that we were subjecting to the continuous system that we were, being, uh, that we were working with, if I have a zero order hold as an as a example, what comes out of a zero order hold is a stepped signal like this. And so um, let's say that the original signal that we, that we were trying to uh, simulate, sorry, let me just get to you. So let's say the original signal that we were trying to simulate had um, a little bit more content than just that step signal. Let's, let's say that we were saying, well, I'm going to take a ramp, right? And I'm going to sample that ramp. And then I'm going to put that sampled signal through a zero order hold. What I would see is a step signal like this, right? And now I have an immediate puzzle. What does it look like? What does it look like if I have a continuous system? And remember, you could say this is maybe something like the TC lab. Um, the actual heater, right? You'll recall that that TC lab heater is getting a held signal because we are writing at, at intervals. We're writing maybe at a, at a one second interval, right? If we plan to ramp up the, the input like that, or we plan to play back any kind of continuous signal at all, the loop that we're using, we'll take a second and another second, or we'll take five seconds, or we'll take 10 seconds, or whatever. And in the intervening time, while conceptually we're ramping up the signal like this, that zero order hold will be holding on to each one of those values at that moment, at that sampling moment um, in the ramp. And so what we will observe is a different response than if we, um, than if we in fact had a continuous response, right? So let's say we, we didn't have that hold element there. We all know, or should, should know by now, that um, the Laplace transform of a ramp is 1 over S squared, and we can kind of go and calculate um, what this response looks like. If I had a continuous process like that, that response would look like kind of the first order ramp response. Right? So it would be a nice, smooth response going... Uh, Kind of first order ramp followed by, or first order response followed by that nice smooth response. But as we've kind of confirmed to ourselves over here, if the sampling rate is large relative to the time constant of the system, a sampled ramp going through a, a zero order hold element will be like these stairs. And the, and the response of the system to that, of the, of the continuous system to that stair uh, input, would actually be uh, this. Right? So it would be these repeated step responses. And this difference is really the key of why we need additional uh, analysis machinery, right? That the fact that we are sampling and holding 
changes the overall response. And fundamentally, you can kind of say, but wait, let's say that's semi-obvious, Carl, because this transfer function is different from this one, right? And that's what, what we, well, let's say the transfer function all the way to there. From the continuous system point of view, the box at the top contains very different elements from the box at the bottom. And so it's kind of obvious that the response would be different, right? And so we need extra machinery in order to do this. Now, the, the, um, the one way to do this is the way that we've been doing it up to now, which is to integrate numerically for the intervening points in time. So in other words, um, we, can, we can, instead of taking these large steps, we can take very, very small steps. And we've seen that successfully we can integrate, if we take very small steps, we can integrate that correctly. But integrating with very, very small steps, firstly, takes time. And secondly, it doesn't admit analysis. It doesn't allow us to ask questions like, what would be the limit of stability for that controller? Would this controller be physically realizable? Right? Those questions are not available through simulation. Because the best we can do is to simulate a lot of different cases and see whether we can maybe drive it to instability. And we would be unsatisfied, or let's say, in the subject, the subject wouldn't exist if we didn't have at least some anal analytical analysis. So everything that we are going to be doing in discrete and using the Z-transform and all of that kind of stuff is in service of being able to escape from simulation on the one hand, which means we are going to need to find a way to find this value, the, the actual sampled value, instead of some estimate of that value. And that's going to be kind of the, we're going to use tables and the Z-transform in order to do this. We're going to develop a set of theory around the stability of Z-transform transfer functions. So we'll find out how to actually analyze those systems. And... Furthermore, we're going to be able to use the Z-transform to come up with the code that we would need to write in order to implement a control. So you'll recall that we've done control design. We did something like direct synthesis, right? And in the direct synthesis design method, we calculated a controller. Now that controller was or took the form of a differential equation. And so over here, we had this interesting puzzle. We said, OK, I've calculated GC as a differential equation. Sorry. So I've calculated GC as a differential equation. And now I'm going to implement that controller using uh, computer code by doing that integration. And Hopefully all of you can imagine that that's quite a wasteful process. This using a lot of uh, computer time, and you guys maybe saw this when you were doing some of your simulations, when you use a very small step and you had to use a very small step for your derivative controller to work correctly in your simulations, when you're using that very small step, the simulations start taking a very long time. And so maybe not on your personal little computer with your personal little system are you going to notice this, but if you work on a SASL with 50 million uh, points, it becomes very important how efficiently your controller can execute. And if I'm doing 100 loops just to get from one time step to another, and I could just jump immediately to the correct part, the guy doing the 100 steps is going to lose to the guy doing one step when they try and sell this controller on the market, or when you try and use your old hardware to do the same job, that efficiency is very worthwhile. And so actually, when you think about it, all of you should have pushed back against using continuous analysis, because none of the controllers that we use these days actually are continuous. In actual fact, every time you build a controller these days, it will be a discrete controller running on discrete hardware. And the other version of what we're going to get out of the Z-transform is a way of taking that controller Z-transform and writing that as 
computer code in a straightforward way. And this is kind of where the difference equations come in. So I've developed a notebook that illustrates this idea uh, very clearly. Okay, so remember we have these three different ways. Of so if you look on that, on that screen, you will see effectively three different strategies for finding this response mapped out, right? Um, the way that we knew how to draw this curve was through knowing the solution of the step response of this first order system analytically through perhaps a Laplace transform or just solving the differential equations, right? So, so that curve has the formula 1 minus e to the uh, minus t. Um, yeah, exactly, just that. Right, so if, if for, the, for the unit gain system that I was working with earlier and for the unit step, if that's a unit step, that just is the formula. So that's the analytic. Right, now, the, the orange that I've drawn here, right, which would obviously kind of move like this, that indicates numeric solution and these red lines indicate analytic discrete response. And so we're going to work through using these three different methods through simulating a feedback control system that looks like this one, right? We have a discrete controller, which means that the controller only wakes up at the sampling points, right? It does the normal error calculation that you used to, so this is like the same, um, and I'm just going to use this notation here, so this is YSP, so we've got an error, we've got a sampled version of the error, the controller doesn't calculate the output all the time, it calculates the output only at the sampling points, the sampler, those things are sent to a hold element, the hold element then controls GP, okay, and we're going to compare this discrete uh, proportional controller to what we by now almost know by heart, which is a continuous controller running on a continuous process with no sampling. And we'll see, the first thing that we'll see is that these responses, firstly, are different, and secondly, require different computations in order to find the responses that we're talking about. Right, so... Let's start with just straightforward numeric simulation of a uh, continuous system. And, and I apologize, I know that this code perhaps may not be as familiar to you as it was uh, for previous classes since we've started moving uh, towards the TB control. But you may at least still recall uh, what we're doing here is just a straightforward, very small time step Euler integration. Uh, now... I think maybe for extra credit or whatever, you could actually go and calculate because remember, first order controller with a first with a, a first order system with a proportional controller, the response, the step response is simply a first order response. So we can, in theory, calculate that analytically. Um, I'm adding this on so that we can kind of see all the moving parts. So there we have our standard. Uh, continuous response. Notice here that I've just, I've, I've mapped this out. I haven't used any magic here, right? I haven't used the sci, uh, I haven't used SciPy and the state space and all of that kind of stuff. I've just gone uh, really straightforward, taken the differential equation, written it out myself by hand, integrated that differential equation. So that's the system uh, equation. And this line over here represents the controller. So I've just got a proportional controller acting on that and I'm integrating using Euler. And so that's what that response looks like. Now, 
When you compare that to the next part, which is a discrete controller which runs at a relatively large sampling rate. The key here is always to remember that the differences between discrete devices and their analog, or let's say the, the, the devices that they are designed to approximate. So many discrete controllers, discrete PIDs, are designed in order to closely approximate a continuous PID. That approximation is most successful when the time steps are very small, right? Um, but we will see that we can um, do the calculations without taking small time steps. And that's kind of where we're ending up. So here we have a discrete controller, and I want you to just look at this code quickly. We are, the outside over here is representing continuous time. It's, it's time that is moving in the small time steps. It's the same time step boiler loop that we had for the previous simulation. Um, and at a particular discrete sampling point, this controller wakes up. It wakes up, it does its calculation, and then it sets the alarm to snooze for another delta t seconds, right? So it goes through a couple of time steps, and then it kind of, oh yes, wait, it's time, do the calculation, go to sleep again. You'll see the other equations are all exactly the same, and what we see is that there is a significant difference between the action of a continuous proportional controller and the action of a discrete uh, proportional controller. So these are proportional controllers. I haven't changed the time constant. I have only changed the fact that the controller is uh, sleeping for a certain amount of time. And in the intervening time, remember that effectively variables in Python work like zero order holds. In other words, when you don't change them, they don't change. If you don't have a line that says change this from here to here, in every other piece of code that uses that variable, it'll just be that value, the last value that it saw. So it's quite useful to think about like zero order hold is really the easiest hold element to picture because it works just like me writing down a value on the board or something like that or just putting a variable into a uh, value into a variable. And if I walk away and I don't look at it for two minutes, when I come back, it'll still be exactly the same thing. Now, um, we'll, we'll kind of dig into this a little bit more, but I just also want to show you that uh, if the sampling time is quite small, the controllers do become very close to one another. So, so, and I mean, this should be obvious just by inspection of the code, where we're doing exactly the same calculation. The only thing that changes is how long we wait until we do that calculation. So if this delta t is very, very small, the controller will work just the same as a continuous controller. And we can kind of investigate this as the step size increases, uh, the differences become more apparent. An important thing to notice is that unlike a, a continuous proportional controller where you'll remember that there was no upper bound on the gain that I could use in a continuous proportional controller acting on a continuous first order process. We had this wonderful thing that like, we could just make the gain bigger and bigger, and, and in fact, when we made the gain bigger, bigger control just got better. Now we have a second variable, which is the sampling time. And so this one parameter controller, proportional only controller, actually has two parameters. It has the sampling time and it has the gain. And it turns out that unlike for continuous proportional controllers, we don't have a guarantee of stability anymore. In fact, with only twice the sampling length, with exactly the same gain that worked quite well with our continuous controller, we are now seeing unstable responses. And so, ideally, and hopefully you are joining me in being curious about recovering similar sets of theorems that we could use to determine the stability of our continuous system for studying our discrete systems, right? The, the, the urge that I'm hoping that you're sharing with me is that 
Well, we learned all this theory. We learned what the limits of uh, stability are. We learned theorems that would allow us to look at a transfer function and tell whether it's stable. We learned further theorems that uh, allowed us not even to have to calculate the closed loop transfer function, but just look at the open loop characteristic and check whether the system would be stable from there. And we learned all these techniques by which we, we could calculate a controller to get to the kind of response that we want. And all of those things we're going to basically walk through exactly the same in the discrete domain. So we're going to recover the same kinds of theories, while well, we're slightly differently worded, but promising the same things. In other words, how can we determine whether the system is stable? How can we determine whether it's buildable or physically realizable? And what techniques can we use to calculate controllers instead of just guessing parameters in PIDs? Right. So, the tools that we will use for this is the Z transform. And I want you to walk through me, or walk through with me through this symbolic calculation. That first figure, um, I hope everybody is really, really comfortable. So the first figure is the, uh, recall, continuous one. So this is the, uh, that we did with a tight Euler loop. We calculated that numerically, and we said, you know what? Very inefficient, right? We could have used the table, or we could have used SymPy. The difference is that with SymPy, um, after having done this inverse Laplace transform, that formula is very, very quick to evaluate. The, it's a lot quicker to calculate the values at all of these points using the formula than it is to go and calculate using Euler. And I want you to see that in all of these notebooks, there is a bit of a trade-off. There's a trade-off between the upfront calculation, which is slightly more involved, and the in-operation calculation, which is usually a lot faster, once we've done all of that other work. Right? So, in general, building a block diagram in Medallica is going to be conceptually easier, but it's going to be slower than doing the calculation once and then using that calculation and just plugging in the formula later. Also recall that many of these discrete devices are very, very simple computers. And so they are not able to run something like Modelica or even Python. Many of them are the kinds of devices like your TC Labs Arduino that you can kind of program, but you have to program it and then flash it and it's got a very small memory. So everything that you want to do, it's better if you do it up front and then you can buy a 10 Rand little chip and especially if you want to make thousands or hundreds of these, or you know, hundreds of thousands of these, uh, that's worth your while. So it's the trade-offs are a little bit different. Okay, but so here we have analytic solution of that. Now, let's do the discrete version of this. And this is where things get a bit hairy. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk you through this once today. And then I'm going to re Go over this again tomorrow, because I want you to kind of get into the habit. Some of this should be super familiar to you from our previous subject, okay? Um, the first thing that we need to do in order to do the calculation the same way as we did for uh, the Laplace transform, remember what we did to obtain that step response. We calculated the Laplace transform of U of T. Right, so we first did the Laplace transform and we got U of S. And we did that either by looking it up in the table or by using SymPy, right? We then had transfer functions for all of these things, right? So we had a transfer function for the controller, which thankfully was just like K. And we had a transfer function for uh, GP, which was our uh, first order transfer function. And we then calculated the closed loop transfer function, GCGP, and we multiplied that by U over S, and then we inverted the Laplace transform, right? And now, so to do the same stuff in the discrete domain, we will require um, U of Z we will calculate a discrete transfer function that relates u of z to y of z. And 
we will then do exactly the same things, right? So we'll calculate the Z-transform of the input. We'll calculate the Z-transform of the closed-loop transfer function. And we'll calculate the Z-transform of Y. To get usable results out of that, and remember that that inverse only gives us values at these particular moments in time, at the, at the sampling points, right? We'll expand that uh, expression using uh, Taylor series, right? And so we can basically do this. I have mapped this uh, into the sampled values function. So you can now import sampled values uh, from TB control symbolic. So you don't have to remember that formula. But that enables us to find the values at those particular moments in time. So that confirms that I've got the right Z transform of the input of the referencing, right? Now we've got the controller. And our uh, big challenge is we have to calculate the Z transform of everything that is within that box, remember? So it's not just G of Z, right? It's not just the thing, the first order transfer function. It's the whole element as well. And so in order to do that, we... Uh, now this, you'll kind of commit to memory eventually because this is such a, a useful uh, way of doing things. We know the formula for the hold element. This is in the data sheet, so you don't have to memorize that either. Uh, and a little bit of manipulation allows you to see that what we're looking for is the thing that is in the table to the right of G of S divided by S. And if you, if you look at the table, so here's, here's that element in the table. The thing that looks like that first order divided by S is over here in the table. That's what the uh, response function looks like. And that's what the Z transform looks like. And so I, I just read that response off the table. And I inserted that into this. Now we have the Z transform of HGZ. Right? In order to calculate... In order to see that that is the right HGZ, we can, we can see that this is the thing that allows us to do that thing that I spoke about earlier today. Where if I put in a step, this gives me analytically the points on that analytic step response curve. Right? That's what the Z transform is giving us. So that's the analytic result that I was speaking about over there. Right? So that's the analytic result. And what we have now is the step responses at each of those intervening uh, points in time. The last piece of magic is calculating the closed loop transfer function. Now that is the same form, and we'll, we'll talk about exactly the nitty gritty here, but you'll, mean, you'll, you'll notice that there is a striking similarity between that formula and the formula that I just wrote down for the continuous transfer function. And now we have the, the points in time from the Z-transform. And I want you to really internalize what's happening here. We have not done any Euler integration to get to this point. We have only used analytic results. So for discrete controllers, obviously the output, or let's say the input that is coming from uh, the whole element, would look like this. How have we calculated that? We've calculated this closed loop response, which means that we know what the value of y is at each of the sampling points. We know what the value of the set point is at each of the sampling points, and I can therefore calculate, knowing what y was and knowing what the set point was, I can calculate the error. I can multiply that error by a constant to get the output that is coming out of the controller, and I can, I can plot this with kind of these uh, steps. And again, what I'm doing here is the points here are what we calculated using the Z-transform. And these straight bits are what uh, is coming out of the original Euler simulation with the small step. So these are not yet analytic results. These are just, the, just so that we know that we're on the right track. So we did it once numerically, and we kind of knew that that 
was relatively trustworthy. We're just trying to recover those same results. The trick we're going to use in order to calculate the output analytically is to understand that if you kind of look at that red line over there, which is the zero line, especially the way that I've plotted it here, it, it becomes quite obvious that you could say, I'm just adding together a lot of like shifted pulses. So there's a pulse here that is from zero to two at time step one. And you can kind of see, well, it's like that goes all the way back to zero. And then for the next time step, we effectively start at zero and go to minus 0.5 something, and we stay there, and then we go back to zero, and then from, from there we go back up to one, and so on. And you can kind of say, well, the effect is the same as if I just took a, a pulse, and another pulse, and another pulse, and another pulse, and another pulse, and each time the size of the pulse is given by the coefficient of the Z transform that I've expanded over there. And so, clearly, if I can calculate the continuous response to a single pulse, so going back here, what I'm doing here is zooming in over here. This is this pulse signal, right? So that's kind of what that looked like. And I'm going to try and figure out what is the response of that system to a single pulse, to a single one of these pulses. So if I just have this, what's going to happen over there? And so we can do that calculation. It turns out quite easily in SymPy. Um, we first calculate a formula for this pulse. And so it turns out that that's basically what that formula looks like. So we have a step up of a particular size, and then a time step later, we have a step down of exactly the same size. That's basically what a uh, pulse looks like. And that first pulse is size two, and so that's the response of the system to that first pulse. So that's the response of the system to the first move that the controller is making. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So it turns out that that shape, we can see what that shape is going to look like. It's going to be kind of a first order response and another first order, kind of first order up and first order down. And uh, again, it's one of those moments that filled me with glee. The first time that I could actually do this analytically using uh, SymPy without doing any manual math. Uh, because up until we started using SymPy for these calculations, you simply would not be able to do the calculation that I'm going to do now. Like, it wouldn't be possible for you because we, well, I mean, it would be possible in principle, but uh, it would be impossible in practice. I wouldn't be able to ask you a question like this because um, we didn't have time. But now, we can very easily say, well, I know what that single pulse response looks like, and I know that if I have a shifted pulse, I'll get a shifted response. And so now I just have to add all those shifted responses together and I'll get the analytic result. And it turns out that the, the math behind that, I've expanded it here just so that I've got something that's notationally convenient, right? So, so we've got our U and I've written that as a series uh, sum. And so that's what U looks like. It's just like this infinite sum of the step coefficients uh, times z to the minus i. That's kind of almost the definition of the z transform. And uh, the output of the controller is um, basically that same coefficient but multiplied by, let me just see if I can, no, it is on do not disturb, I don't know why. Oh. Um, the output from the system is going to be just that held version um, multiplied by um, the transfer function. And so we have, I'm building up here, this is u of z, this is u of s, which is the held version, that's the, that's the stepped, um, and u times the hold element of s is now calculated symbolically over there. Okay, so that's, for those of you who are unfamiliar with, um, I like the symmetry of that sum notation there with the 
way that the sum looks, but if you're not familiar with um, kind of uh, how these list comprehensions work, that's equivalent to doing it in a for loop. So I'm just basically starting at zero and adding all those terms. Uh, so what that actually looks like, just do that. So that's what the, so that's the expression, and this is why you can tell that I wouldn't be able to ask you this back in the day if you had to do all of the calculations manually, right? Because you would have to, uh, you would have to keep track of all of this um, nastiness uh, on, a, on an exam book. And I think you would be asking for more and more exam books if you had to calculate all of that. Work all of these out, work out the inverse Laplace transform, shift it, and so on. So SimPy is doing us a solid over here. Um, and what is, what is really mind-blowing is um, I can multiply that by the transfer function because now I've got the, I've got the Laplace transform of that held signal. I just multiply that by the transfer function and I ask SimPy to calculate the inverse Laplace transform. Now, it does take a while. But I now have an analytic expression for the entire control response. And it's, it's kind of crazy that like I haven't used at all, I haven't at all used any numeric simulations yet. I've used the computer, but I've only done analytic operations in order to arrive at the second version of this diagram. And we'll be using this exact same strategy uh, later to show that some of the design techniques that we're going to be using, specifically the techniques where we target a particular response, has this extra loophole that gets opened up when we sample in the sense that we will design for like a first order response, but the design will only be specified at the point where we sample. And we will have to do some additional mathematics to make sure that the system doesn't kind of get there in a strange way. Um, and this is kind of really amazing because we can do it completely analytically. We can actually do the full analytic math all in SimPy. It does work for almost all of the systems that I know of in the book. Um, Keep in mind that SimPy is not completely magic. It is amazing, but it is not magic. And so when we use this technique for very long periods of time with very short sampling rates, it first becomes very slow and then breaks. Mostly for some of the same reasons that you saw inverse Laplace transforms break last year when you were doing inverse Laplace transforms of complicated systems. And so it is, in some cases, while this is incredibly gratifying, uh, it is not a practical technique for long-term simulation. So stuff that you're doing with your TC lab, if, you, if you're trying to calculate the effect on long time periods with short, I would stay away from this technique. Look at this notebook mostly so that you can verify for yourself that the analytic math that we are doing is valid. Um, but the, this these two lectures put together, or the, the kind of combination that's going to end up on YouTube, um, what I've hoped to show you here is not like some practical way of doing discrete simulations. If you want to do discrete simulations, practically just use Medallica. Uh, or Bloxim has discrete blocks in as well, that's fine. So for practical simulations for long periods of time, and if you just want to see the results, absolutely use numeric simulation. This is so that you understand that the analytic techniques that are discussed in the book, where all of that actually comes from, and to ensure that they actually work. So we can recover analytically all the same results uh, that we could recover using simulation. And that is the key insight into trusting that the Z-transform is reliable. And we can kind of say, we understand that what it's doing is uh, simplifying the calculations behind that uh, analytic Laplace transform. Also keep in mind that uh, this stuff that I've just said about this proviso about like breaking is mostly about the inverse Laplace transform when we're trying to calculate the intervening uh, intermediate positions. Uh, the full on Z transform, discrete uh, transform, 
is perfectly usable for very long coefficients if you use numeric coefficients uh, only and you don't use symbolic manipulation in SymPy. Uh, you can use convolution to multiply them and you can use the built-in support in SciPy uh, to do discrete calculations if you only want results at the sampling point. And so basically, to sum up the three strategies, I just want to get back to this thing that we've, that we've spoken of before. When we're, doing, when we're dealing with discrete systems, and especially when we are plotting responses, we have three options. And we've now, I've now illustrated all three of them. We can, we can use numeric simulation, and I've exaggerated the error here, but it's just so that you understand that when you do numeric simulation, there is always the opportunity for error. So, uh, we can do numeric simulation. This is what uh, Medallica, SciPy, DLTI, and those tools, what all of them do. Uh, we can go full-on analytic. Uh, we can get analytic responses at the discrete points using SymPy. We can get responses at the uh, sampling points using discrete mathematics in SciPy, which is much more robust for longer, but requires numeric coefficients. And we can also go full on analytic all the way down to continuous, to get the continuous responses analytically, including sample systems. And so if you followed along through all of the techniques that we've just done, you now know everything that is possible to do, what I know is possible to do with discrete mathematics in terms of simulating uh, finding the responses of various parts of the signal um, in this subject.